We even say to our kids as adults now, whatever you learn from mom and I, Tracy and I, that was healthy about our, our, our faith, our relationship, sexuality, all that was good, take it with you. But our dysfunction, what you saw in us that wasn't healthy, leave it here with us. You know, please learn a better way. And uh, we offer that humility as a way of saying, now we don't have it all figured out either. We're, we're on our journey, but let's, let's create a learning kind of mindset as we move forward and we can all learn together. Welcome to Husband Material. Today we have a couple with us, Rodney and Tracy Wright, authors of this amazing book, How to Talk with Your Kids About Sex. I love the title and I love the book even more. It's actually the best book I've ever read on this topic. Thank you guys so much for being on the show today. Thanks, Drew. Yeah, thank Thanks you, Drew. Us and for the compliment on the book. Absolutely. Who are you and why did you write this book? Uh, well, Rodney and Tracy Wright, we live in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. We have been married uh, 31 years yeah. and working on our 32nd year. Uh, we have three adult children. Uh, one of our daughters married. And um, so I've served for 30 years as a uh, pastor at a local fellowship. And uh, my journey of healing through pornography, sexual addiction started almost 25 years ago in my mid 20s. There's a lot to that whole story, but basically, you know, I wasn't transforming and my religion didn't seem to help. And so I sought some help through a professional uh, sexual trauma assessment treatment therapist, which was uh, not really kosher to do in the 90s. There wasn't a lot of people trending this way within religious circles and just a godsend for me. And that started me on a three year process of learning how to retrain my brain and how sexual addiction is a brain issue, not just a moral issue. And that led to Tracy and I's journey toward uh, disclo full disclosure and our healing journey and uh, we continue to serve in local churches and then about two about seven years ago we came across pure desire through a friend joe mccarthy uh who sponsors this podcast through melts grilled cheese sandwich and if you're ever in Coeur d'Alene area go get a grilled cheese and tell him rodney sent you and you get a 10 percent discount so joe honor that and um anyway we found pure desire we loved it because of their holistic approach, Drew, of healing. And they were integrating um, a Christ-centered approach with the clinical studies. And that resonated deeply with us. So we jumped on board. And I've served as a board member there for four years. And we currently resigned our church, um, wrote a book. And we're, we're trying to help the cause by being a voice for pure desire and, and raising resources for them and helping other churches know of what their ministry can do uh, to get groups for men and women in churches and really help religion have a different conversation about this. And so our book came from just not helping the male or female addict or the man or woman who's been betrayed. Our book was like, how do we become proactive and how do we help the young parents train their kids? So it's a whole different conversation about sexuality than many of us got growing up. Yeah, I think our journey has been a long one, obviously together, 31 years, and then that 25 years of just working on recovery and what that looks like and what healing looks like. And both of us grew up in the church. And so we had to look at our belief system. What do we believe about ourselves, God and others? And just so we've been walking this journey together in the last um you know, almost 10 years has been a part of recovery. It, it wasn't always so public that we were, that we were talking about our journey, right? It was, it was that private pain that we had a few people walking through with us uh, for so many years. And then just one step after another in our recovery to where we are to share our story with others and encourage others to be vulnerable and to share their story. Awesome. Well, I'm really excited you guys are here because so many of us are wondering how do I talk with my kids about sex, especially if I struggle with pornography? How right. do I talk about my past sexual mistakes? Like, right. what do I do? And if I want to be a parent in the future, I want to prepare myself. And we were all parented, so we're all asking, how do mm -hmm. I recover from the rubble of what my parents did and didn't mm -hmm. do? Right, right. 
You know, Drew, we even say to our kids as adults now, whatever you learn from mom and I, Tracy and I, that was healthy about our, our, our faith, our relationship, sexuality, all that was good, take it with you. But our dysfunction, what you saw in us that wasn't healthy, leave it here with us. You know, yes. please learn a better way. Mm -hmm. And uh, we offer that humility as a way of saying, now we don't have it all figured out either. We're, we're on our journey, but let's, let's create a learning kind of mindset as we move forward and we can all learn together. And I think even though we look like uh, the big people who have it all figured out to our kids, we're really kids when we're yeah. raising them, right? We're yeah. still learning and figuring out who I am and how this life works. Yeah. And we're mm -hmm. trying to impart that to our kids. And I know that more now than I did back then that I didn't have it all figured out. And now, now we have young adult kids and we're adults together, still kind of on that journey of figuring it out, still, yeah. still kind of working through our stuff and, and taking steps forward. Yeah. And I love how in the book you say, God is the perfect parent and even his kids strayed from the path. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And there were three of them, father, son, and spirit. Well, three in one, yeah. but I, you know, <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So I don't know that it's about being a perfect parent or uh, what does it even mean to grow kids God's way or like God does? That sense of we have freedom of choice. Mistakes are part of our learning. I think it's about lowering shame. And uh, I think the heart of God has always been nothing but having our human's best interest. I think that's always been the heart of the divine. And, and we see that so clearly in Jesus. God is exactly like Jesus. And God has nothing but our best interest and only wants to heal us, not to hurt us. And so I think that's an important part of our faith. And if your faith doesn't give you that framework, then you just might want to evaluate your faith a little bit more in light of who Jesus is and how he embraced humanity. Yeah. So we have that foundation of being embraced by him. Yes. Even as parents, we can relax a little bit. Totally. We can remember that mistakes are how we learn and grow. So with that as a starting point, that we are all on this journey of growth and learning, one of the things that blew my mind was the very first point of the book. You divide it up into 10 memorable short tips. And the first one is pursue personal health. And I read that and I thought, you're telling me that if I want to teach my kids about sex, that first I need to be healthy? <laughs> what a concept, huh? <laughs> yeah. Well, as we used to say in California, you got to smoke what you're selling. You know what I mean? Yes, yes. So it's one thing to talk out of this side of your mouth and then over mm -hmm. here be doing something different. And mm -hmm. it kind of goes back to what we model is more important than what we say. We, we, we hit that point later on in the book. But part of that, Drew, is I, I just thought I was a big mess up, and then I was a religious mess up, and then I was a pastor who was a religious mess up. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I just had such a low self-esteem in, in some ways about just am I worthy of love? And if you love yourself, that's, that's the not narcissistic, but self-care, um, treating yourself like you would a cherished friend. And if I had a friend that was struggling, I would say, let's go get help, man. Come on, buddy. Let's go find a counselor a group let's go get help you know and i just think for the parent that's the best gift you're going to give your kids see that you're worthy of help it's easy for people to say i messed this up so let's just move forward ignore it and mm. help my kid and then there sometimes you're parenting out of fear because it's like uh you know i don't want them to know this about me or that it'll give them license to make those choices or i'm so ashamed of the mistakes that i made that i just i want to do better you know almost all of us want to do better as a parent um but it's hard to do better when we haven't gone back and faced it and gotten the healing that we need yeah so this is quite a radical message if yeah. you didn't catch that if you want to teach your kids first become healthy yourself right yeah, so w which means maybe you've been hurt by someone's addiction. Uh, maybe there's negative history like an abortion or an abuse or something that maybe, um, you know, if that happened to you. Um, healing from the shame of that. Uh, it's a quote by Brene Brown, who's done such great work. You know, when you deny your story, it defines you. But when you own it, you can write a brave new ending. There's mm -hmm. something just about saying, 
as an addictive person, that's a piece of my journey, but that's not the whole story of my life. And so just learning how to own those parts of your story and, and the shame is really, I think our biggest enemy, the shame. And this is where religion, if you're not careful, religious religion can cause more harm than good. If it has a shame layer to it. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit more about the difference between shame and punishment and training? Yeah. Um, I think shame, you know, I used to get guilt and shame confused, you know, same together. I have a lot of guilt and shame. Uh, guilt to me is like my conscience telling me, Rod, you're not going the better way here, but this is not going to work out well. So my guilt is the, 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 the God consciousness, the spirit within me uh, telling me that wasn't right. You violated your will. You did something wrong. You did something bad. Shame is the message that says, at your core, you're bad at your core. And so that's the truth of our, that we think that's the truth of our being. And then we tend to live out of that truth. And I, I think the truth that we see in the gospel, in, in scripture, is that first of all, we're good and we're made in the image mm -hmm. of God. Mm -hmm. And so I think, and sin distorts that though. Sin distorts our ability to see ourselves clearly and to see others clearly. And then many times we just live out of that distorted view instead of getting a, a clear picture of, of love. And then historically, um, shame has been a way of parenting. So uh, it was taught sometimes by parent onto the next parent. And I think we're getting better at that. I think we're, there's a lot more research on it. People have a, more of an understanding of it. But if we were parented out of our own parents' shame, even if they didn't intend to, we're going to sometimes pass that on. So just being aware of it and what the difference is between training and guiding versus shaming and punishing helps me when I go to that shame, because I will, and some of my messages will be shaming towards my children, mm -hmm. to be aware of it and correct mm -hmm. that and yep. then continue down a different path. Yes, and that shame can be communicated verbally like Rodney just talked about or non-verbally. And you talk about how what we model is more important yeah. than what we say. So sometimes I can be giving a guilt message like you did something bad, but my nonverbals oh, are yeah. still being received yeah. as shame. And many of us grew up, Drew, with a, with a statement, shame on you, Rodney. Mm. Shame, you know, so when you did something wrong, shame on you. And it's like, shame off you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, shame off you because Amen. shame does not help anybody. Um, so... I think when you don't live with shame and you make a mistake in some area, you can just say, you can have a little grace for yourself and say, Hey, I made a mistake today. I'm going to learn from that. And it, it's, it's even beginning to see our addiction differently where we can almost say addictive addiction. You were just trying to help me cope, but I'm not going to need your services any longer. <laughs> so I want you to know our, our relationship's changing. So you just kind of learn to befriend the mistake, learn from it, but, but not let it be something that shames you and that, that you carry on as this. And it took me a long time, Drew, to be honest. My, my shame really began to heal, not just with my therapist or talking to Tracy, but it really healed when I got in a group with other men. And my buddy Joe, who I already gave a shout out to, um, he was one of those individuals that I just saw a guy not living with any shame, trying to own his story. And he didn't have a, a, a steep religious upbringing. And I think in some ways, you know, our, our religion, if it's bringing shame, it's something to back away from and unlearn because I think we're missing the teachings of Jesus in that regard. And when we're parenting around the area of sexuality, the tendency can be to shame our kids because of the fear that comes. If they watched something, if they, if we see that they saw pornography, um, it's so shocking sometimes to parents, especially, you know, if you're doing your best to help them and then it's like you failed as a parent or, you know, the messages that we tell ourselves or just that fear of, of how our kids are going to respond to that instead of understanding that in our culture, it's not if they see this, it's when they see this yeah. and that that's a great opportunity to not punish. It's not, I need to take away your cell phone and around you for a month. It's, it's about, that's where the training and guiding comes in. And I think that's a really big area. Right. Those teachable moments. Those yeah, absolutely. 100 one minute conversations, not the one 100 minute conversation. Exactly. And how yeah. in those moments you talk about being shock proof. Yeah. 
yeah, and how right. a lot of these situations just diffuse themselves if we don't mm -hmm. overreact. And I think that that's where the health of the parent really is played out best is mm -hmm. in those moments day to day. You're kind of learning how to self-regulate, how to be self-aware, how to manage the stressors in your life well. So you're not living with the, the, the guilt uh, of addiction or all those things. So then when a situation happens, it's a teachable moment. And, yeah. and when it comes to the development <laughs> of our kids, um, like I, I share a story in the book about being caught streaking my brother and I as little kids, you know, we yeah. were just, we were kind of dumb and dumber on the front porch and a neighbor kid uh, told us to streak around. And so we did it in the summer, totally innocent, not trying to be perverted. Just this kid was 10. We thought he knew everything about life, you know? So we went, you know, <laughs> I say my brother went first and I went second, you know? <laughs> well, when my dad came home that day, it was more about training kids just because an older kid says to do something, you don't have to do it. And, and nudity is okay because I want you to be nude every time you take a shower and I want you, you can take your clothes off when you go to the bathroom. I mean, you know, there's certain places that nudity is really good, but not necessarily in the front street of the house, you know? So it, it would have been a great training opportunity. And my dad, who's 92 and my, one of my best friends today, he just did the best he could with what he knew. He thought we needed to be spanked and scolded and grounded, but we, we were just, we were just seven and eight. We just needed to be trained and guided. So the more the parent can just understand and get a bigger perspective, they can help not create shame to sexuality, but they can help create just awareness and learning how to now manage our sexuality in healthy ways. And when you've learned to become a healthy adult, then you've learned to regulate yourself sometimes and be able to step back from the situation. That's part of that getting yeah. our own healing, right? I can step back from the situation now because I know how to do that and look at what is actually needed at this time. A lot of times it might be just the training. Sometimes there is a consequence that's needed, but I'm able to step out of the emotion of the moment and look at what's in the best interest of my child. Yes, and amen. <laughs> so in order to do that, we have some of our own shame that we need to work through around yeah. sexuality. And I thought it could be kind of fun to do that live here on this episode. If Why not? we could just maybe use some of the appropriate language that we need to be able to talk about with our kids. What do you think? Yeah, let's go for it. Let's dive into the deep end. <laughs> All right. So some basic vocabulary. Um, we need to have a grasp on would be things like penis, vagina, penis, <laughs> vagina, yeah, erection, orgasm, mm -hmm. you know, uh, menstrual cycle, uh, you know, breast, uh, erection, you know, the, just language about sexuality. That's, that's one of our points is practice communication. If you're not used to hearing those words, then yeah. they could come across as somehow, you know, evil or mm -hmm. uncomfortable. Yeah. Um, and, and home needs to be the place where we learn about all that. We're learning about our ears, our noses, penis, vagina. Drew, you were telling me a story on the, uh, on the phone yeah. the other day with your daughter. I thought it was fabulous. I was like, that's a home run. Drew, way to go. I want to share that story. So my daughter was holding two lemons in her hands and she put them on her head and I said hey those look like Mickey Mouse ears or Minnie Mouse ears and then she put them on her ears and I said those look like really big earrings and then she put them on her chest I said those look like big breasts and then she kept going down she put a lemon on her belly button I said that looks like a really big belly button and then she put it right between her legs and I said now it looks like you have a big penis. And then she started laughing a little bit. And then she kept going and she put them behind her. And I said, now it looks like you have big butt cheeks. And then <laughs> she ran out of things to do with the lemons and she put them down and moved on. Yeah. yeah. So you just normalized those things instead of don't don't put it, the lemon there. That's the bad place. <laughs> right. Right. Or, or my dad yeah. just said the word breast and now the child freaks out. Because of your health and your okay with vocabulary, yeah. you were just giving proper names to proper locations of our body. And she saw that in a normal setting. And it took so much presence of mind just mm -hmm. to be able to 
stay calm and <laughs> be okay. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, and like, yeah. what do I say now? How do I say that? How do I right. say it in an appropriate way that's helpful? You know, right. I right. think being prepared for that, and some of that's been your work, obviously, Drew, to yeah. be prepared for that as a parent. Some parents might come naturally a little bit to that in the conversation, but most don't. I definitely was one that didn't, and I probably didn't use the word masturbation until several years ago. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So now that I say it publicly out loud, it's like, oh, okay, and that we've had a lot of conversation around around that. And, you know, it, it really is helpful, but it's not usually our starting point, unless we had parents who talked openly about it. Yeah. Um, sometimes our culture talks openly about it, but it's not in a healthy way. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So then again, we have the mixed message of, wow, our culture is now really open about talking about masturbation, right. but is it in a healthy way? Tracy always teases me that when I die on my epitaph, she's going to say, Rodney was an expert in masturbation. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure the reader will be able to like, have context to understand that. But at least we're talking about it. You know what yes. I'm saying? It's like we're right. talking about it. We're offering conversation instead of religion yeah. being silent and yeah. demonizing and thinking that all sexual feelings are lust. Yeah, and I say that because Rod is very passionate about talking about that subject. You can tell in the book it was really important to him to get a message across. And the message wasn't, here's what I think is the right way. You need to do that. It was, here are ways to look at this. And you need to look at it and ponder it and think about it and about what you believe about that. And so that's why I tease him about that. But it really comes out of that. He grew up where you couldn't talk about it all. There's so much shame. And then he wants to be able to help people have open conversations so that they can manage that in a healthy way. Yes. And the way it comes across in the book is very fatherly, very parental of allowing a child to make their own decision based on good information and a lot of emotional support. Right. Right. Yeah, exactly. I think that's when you can guide them better when there's openness and honesty and and Mm -hmm. those open dialogues about those things. You know, you were guiding your daughter to be a safe parent, you know, and you want to be parents and that's hard because sometimes we think well you know I just want to punish them (laughs) or whatever but we really want to be a safe parent because otherwise they're going to close off and not come to us when a topic comes up right so outside the church we have this very permissive culture when it comes to sexuality Mm -hmm. inside the church we have this toxic purity culture right Yeah. yeah and one of my favorite lines I learned from you two is the idea that healthy is the new holy, a way of reframing purity and holiness to truly reflect a biblical perspective. Can you share more about that? Well, God, Father, Son, and Spirit, and I won't get too theological because I love these conversations, so Tracy will poke me if I go too long, but the essence of the divine is healthy relationship, Father, Son, and Spirit. The Trinity, they're mutually indwelling without losing their distinctiveness. So it's really the sexual image where, where the scripture says that the two become one in a husband and wife. It's it's the sexual imagery, right? So the Trinity is, is this beautiful relationship of other-centered self-giving love. So holy is really all about right relationship with yourself and other people. So if that's the context, instead of a squeaky clean Ajax kind of a of a morality, but just learning how to live out of loving yourself, of love. This is why Jesus said, by this sign will all men know you're my disciples, that you love one another. The greatest commandment, loving with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, love your neighbor as you love yourself. Love is the essence of it. And so seeing that we are worthy of love and living out of loving, saying, is this loving to Tracy? Is this loving to Rodney? Is this act loving to society? If it is, then I, I think we're pretty clearly on the path of following the way of Jesus. Right. And so that sense of managed versus mismanaged and healthy versus unhealthy. I think it's way better language than like Christian sex or non-Christian sex or, you know, Christian tacos, non-Christian tacos, (laughs) or we just kind of make everything Christian and non-Christian. And I don't, you know, music, music is either healthy or unhealthy. You know, Um, you don't have to sing about Jesus to have a healthy song. Right. You can just sing about love. You can sing about the relationship of a, a father and a son or a grandpa that you love or 
you know, there's all kinds of wonderful, healthy music out there that opens up the heart space because they talk about relationships and love and about um, having the best interest of yourself and others. So it, it, with, in sexuality, it's about right relationship, right? I used to say to uh, high school boys, I'd have like 25 high school boys and I'd have just, you know, try to do sex talks with them the best we could. And I'd say, guys, when you have an erection, here's what I want you to do. I want you to stop and say, God, thank you for this ability. And they looked at me like I was crazy. Yeah. And, and I would say, you know, because when you get my age, it doesn't happen as often. And we kind of laugh about it. Ha, ha, ha. But I'd say, God, thank you for this ability. Help me now to manage this in a way that honors myself and honors other people. So they're integrating, right? Yeah. So, some people don't even believe that Jesus of Nazareth, as a 16-year-old as a or a 20-year-old, even had an erection. For some people, that can't, that, that can't even fit in their theology, that Jesus had to manage his erection as a man, fully human, right? So our sexuality isn't innately evil. We're made in their image. The ability to bond, the ability to feel uh, ecstasy and erotic feelings, and the ability to procreate, you know, to, to participate in this story of creation by uh, creating children ourselves. It's a, it's a wonderful miracle. I'm quiet in case Tracy wanted to chime in on healthy is the new holy. Yeah, well, I think that um, we look at it from a more holistic viewpoint. Even for me, I have redefined a little bit just the word sin has such connotations to people and sometimes so much shame around it. And I heard um, someone describe it as sin is just unbeing. Mm -hmm. It's when I'm not acting out of my true self, out of my mm -hmm. core, my, that image of God. That is so helpful to me. And I like to use language like that with my children, because yeah. if I say that sin, they're trying to figure out what does that mean? And am I sinning all the time? And how do I ask forgiveness? And all of that, and if, if I can just look at us unbeing, which really is missing the mark, which we, mm -hmm. people translate sin as, but um, it's easier for me to, to evaluate, am I off from who I'm intended to be? Am, mm -hmm. am I unbeing right now in my actions and attitudes? That would be to me yes. more healthy than holy. And that is so different from the typical purity narrative where mm -hmm. I'm born with a state of spotless, perfect behavior, which I can lose in a moment. Right, yeah. Rather than a quality of character, which I'm gaining over time. And that's a completely different view of what it means to have godly right. sexuality, to be healthy, to have right. this being rather than unbeing, to be in right relationship. And, and so some of these questions about, well, where's the line? You know, what exactly mm -hmm. is sin? They, they kind of yeah. dissipate when we have this deeper perspective on right. how we were made in the image of this relational Trinitarian God yes. who's inviting us to be connected and to become yeah. confident and yeah. to honor ourselves and one another. Like, that's just so much more exciting and so much more real. Yeah, and learning yeah. to listen to that and that, that that spirit, the love will be your guide, right? Jesus said that, you know, lo love is where it lands on, you know, yeah. hmm. and that, that I got, you know, this concept that um, when Jesus was on the cross, you know, he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It was because there he took on the sin of Rodney and the whole world and the holy God couldn't look upon him. So God turned his face away. This was the theology I got that that holy can't look, can't look on unholy. And so I just used to think every time I relapsed, God was turning his face on me. He was abandoning me. So I'm trying to always get back in good graces for uh, repent enough. I used to think, or, you know, tip the repento meter just to get God to turn back and love me again. <laughs> but, but you realize when, when Jesus said, my God, my God, he was quoting Psalm 22. It was a prophecy. It wasn't a prayer. And you get to verse 24 of that chapter. And it says, but you, O God, will not neglect the neglected, nor will you turn your face from him. But when he cries, you will hear. So coming to believe that God doesn't, God can't abandon us. That's, that's not in the heart of God to abandon or turn from us. That the incarnation is about God has such a high view of humanity that God became one of us. And in the incarnation, God took on our, our nature and resisted sin his whole life to destroy sin and death for humanity. So... 
for me, it's the lie is you can't, you can't be separated from this God. You, you can turn, but this God won't turn, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And I love how in the last chapter of the book, Never Turn Away, you talk about how that needs to be our posture towards our kids, no matter what their sexual choices are, no matter how far they run, no matter... Or have different, or have different sexual values than we have, yeah. right? Yeah. Right. So we are to imitate God, yes. specifically Jesus, because there is no God different than Jesus. Right. Yeah, yeah. That's and, important uh, when you read the yeah. scripture. God is exactly like Jesus. Yeah. And the climax, we'll use that as a sexual term, but the climax of scripture <laughs> is Jesus. Yeah. He's, the, he, he's, he's the pinnacle. Mm -hmm. In fact, Jesus said something like this. You search the Bible or the scriptures trying to find eternal life to the religious people. And he says, the scriptures testify of me. I'm it, guys. <laughs> and you refuse to come to me. So to me, it's so important that you understand all the Bible through the lens of Jesus. Jesus has to become your rabbi to help you understand the text. Because if not, we can get some distorted views of yeah. what yeah. humans tried to understand what the divine was like. And scripture is this unfolding story of people trying to understand. Yeah. And the ultimate revelation is Jesus. And Jesus came to show us how to be human. Right. And whenever he encountered someone who was in the middle of sexual brokenness, whether what they've done, what's been done to them or both, he always moved toward. Yes. He yes. always came closer. He yeah. took this posture of yeah. humility and openness and asking questions. And that's yeah. how we need to be as parents, right? Yeah, redemptive. It wasn't punitive. It was redemptive, right? So this is where we kind of are afraid of this God's judgment. You know, holy God's going to judge us. Well, instead of seeing God as a judge, why don't you see God as a physician? Let's just call him the great physician. And instead of sin or unbeing, being a mistake to be punished, mm -hmm. what if it's just a distorted disease to be healed? So if God's like a doctor... When you go to the doctor, you would welcome a doctor's judgment because yeah. the doctor's judgment is going to lead you to healing. Yeah. So, so you would actually welcome the judgment of God, right? You would say, God, judge me with your judgment, you know, right. with, you know, help me, heal me from the core. What I hear you saying is that we do need to embrace the language of scripture and sometimes little adjustments in the framework can help us. Yes to yes. get a better handle on what these words actually mean, like holiness and judgment, like those are important concepts and we've twisted them. So we need a little bit of a kick in the paradigm, as you right. like to say. Because <laughs> yeah. we all have our lens of how we look at things. You know, we all have our lens and our lens came from how we grew up. It came from our church and whoever was speaking about scripture to us, yeah. whoever our mentors were. Yeah. Um, there's just so many ways of, of seeing things, and it always has our own human bias within it. And so, again, Drew, as you pointed out, and Rodney, um, going back to the spirit of Christ, right? The, not the letter of the law, but the spirit of the law, which is always love, you know, and, and Christ says that, that all of Scripture is, comes back to this. It's based on love. And it's not messy grace or permission to get away with. And it, but it's not transactional. You know, I said this prayer, therefore I won't go to hell. Meanwhile, I'm living in my own hell of addiction. You know, it's about transforming us. So is, is your religion, is, the, is your Christianity, is your faith moving you to follow Jesus to where you're transforming and being a more loving person of yourself and other people? I think that's part of the litmus test. You know, is the fruit of the spirit being a part of our daily lives? And um, that's where I see it. And I think that's why we started out, or that's why that is a, a big part of our book that we wrote, mm -hmm. because we really believe that, I mean, the truth is, whatever we believe about self, God, and others is going to come out in how we parent. So we can give you all the practical tools on, here's yeah. the what, right way to do this, and the right words, and all of that. But if you don't have underneath that mm -hmm. a beautiful way of seeing self, God, and others, mm -hmm. then you're going to miss those pieces anyway. And if you do have that, you're going to make your course adjustments, and yeah. you're going to keep growing, and you're going to get on that right path to giving your children what they need. So in this episode and in your book, you could have focused exclusively on technique and step-by-step, -step, 
rules and guidelines, and you didn't. And I'm so grateful for that because you're going much deeper into the core of, of what's going to bubble up into the kind of growth, the kind of health that can look different in different families. And it's not bound up to one code of um, behavior. Yeah. You talk about how sex education for our kids and for ourselves too yeah. starts at birth. Yeah. What do you mean by that? So that's a great question. So we're sexual beings from birth. So, you know, uh, within the first 24 hours of birth, a female girl can vaginally lubricate. And in the first five minutes, a little boy can have an erection, right? It's not because they're perverted. It's just because that's how they are, male and female. That's, we're made in the image of God, and we both reflect that. And our sexuality is a part of that. And so even the concept, I think it's good to wrestle with that God is sexual, Right that the divine is sexual because we're made in their image. So just, just start wrapping your brain around that. And now as sexual beings, male and female, the ongoing language and the learning about your body. And again, it's those age appropriate discussions all along the way, because the kids just aren't born with our framework. You know, we have a lot of framework growing through life that kind of help us. They don't have that. So we get to be people who kind of build some framework and some structure about, oh, I can always talk to my mom and dad about this or that, or mom and dad are safe or, or I wonder about this. I heard somebody say this on the bus coming home from school, you know? And the temptation is to wait until they hit puberty. Yeah. <laughs> then we're going to unload all the information. <laughs> Hopefully you don't ask me any more questions. Maybe some parents are hoping for questions. Most are hoping this settles it and we don't have to talk about it again. But um, that's not the best way, right. obviously, to have that information. So starting from birth would mean, again, like Rodney was saying, you recognizing that they're a sexual being. My child is a sexual being. And Mm -hmm. now when they're old enough to be verbal, I'm teaching them words to use Mm -hmm. and the proper names for things. And then one of the ways that we really think is a a great way is, first of all, you can get a book like our book to talk about with your spouse and to use those words together so you get comfortable with them and comfortable talking about them or if you're single with another person and that way you become comfortable before you start talking with your kids so you don't have that shocked look all the time if they say it a word or scream penis in the restaurant or something like that so being able to do that and then as they get a little older even having books in your home that yes. are on anatomy, child's books, where you, when you're reading a book with them at night, like just like you normally would, you pull out that book and you go through the body parts, just like you did with your daughter, Drew. Yours was more spontaneous. But, um, you know, that that's allowing something, even if it doesn't come up, allowing it to be comfortable in our home to talk about. So yeah. that's what we would mean by those yeah. earliest years. It's not giving them too much information. Right. But they're seeing anatomy in a non hypersexualized way. So yeah. they're seeing that God made boys' bodies different than girls' bodies. And they're seeing that on the lap of mom and dad at four, just reading a book. Yeah. But it's not in a over-sexualized way, if you know what I'm saying. Yeah. It's just in a normal way of this is our bodies. You know, there's not arousal connected to it. They're just understanding right. and learning about the body. And you normalize it and then you turn the page and here's the bouquet of balloons and you're just on to the storyline. You know? Yeah. You shared this video about the Pantasaurus. <laughs> yeah. What's in your pants belongs only to you. If someone yeah. asks to see, just tell them no. It's catchy, huh? It's catchy. Hey, it's been Jim. in my head for a month. <laughs> because I, I've watched it with my daughter and she asks to watch it sometimes. And it's yeah. teaching some of these principles which are very helpful with some yes. of the little boys and girls she's interacting with. Exactly. Yeah. And I love that because it's when you see it, right, Drew, it's kind of mm-hmm. shocking. It's like, why are we watching this? <laughs> but that's how kids, little kids learn. And it is, it's really healthy information. And so yeah. I want that clicking in their head along with the ABCs, you know, or whatever. Yeah. But, um, they're going to, they're going to pick that up much more than you having a stranger danger conversation with mm-hmm. them. I, you know, so there's mm-hmm. creative ways to help our kids all the way along the way, you know. 
Drew, I remember one time I was putting my son to bed and he asked me, Dad, how come my penis gets hard? He was like five years old, you know. He knew what to call his body part. He felt safe to ask his dad. And it wasn't like I went up there to put him to bed thinking, I hope he asked me this question. I mean, it just kind of came out of the blue. And my response to him was just, it was probably one of the times I got it right of some of the times I didn't get it right, which I write about in the book as well. But I said, that's how God made your body. So his first question to sexuality was that God made him this way, right? And that happens to your dad and every other man as well. And in the morning when you wake up, it means you have to go pee. I mean, he was five years old, right? Yeah. It was language that he could understand. But just meeting our kids there with this open, it's typically no more than 30 seconds or a minute conversation. It's not about, you, you know, I used to think I had to give them all the information in one setting. Yeah. And, and, and when my kids were 12, they'd say, whatever you do, don't ask dad about puberty. He'll just talk forever. My <laughs> kids would tease me, like, don't ask dad about puberty. Don't ask dad about puberty, <laughs> you know. Because I just wanted to give him so much information, and I and, and I realized uh, it's just small snippets along the way, teachable moments, you know. It is, and when we don't get those, it not only creates a kind of forbidden, magicalized yeah. quality to sexuality, which then becomes kind of dangerous and thrilling, and we know where that leads. We can't talk about it. Right, right, and yet it's activating pleasure. Yeah. So. Yeah having both of those realities together. Well, maybe there's something I'm missing out on. Maybe I've been kept from the, from the beauty, from the magic. Having those 101 minute conversations also protects us from possible abuse. Correct. Mm -hmm. So if we don't have these conversations with our kids and if our parents didn't have them with us, that was actually a setup. For, because the lines yeah. of communication are open and if something ever feels yucky in your stomach or in your gut or somebody's making you do something that you feel uncomfortable please tell mom and dad about it right. right please tell the adults in your life that really love you even if it's somebody that you know but you're opening those communication lines and, and if the nonverbal communication has unwittingly made them feel worse about themselves they're yes. not going to come Right, 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 right. It, and that's it, not the sick. kid's fault. No, you're as sick as your secrets, but you feel like it's a secret because nobody talks about it. Or if I even mention the subject, yeah. um, I, I write in the book about a, a, a kid who says to his dad, dad, I find myself having a lot of wet dreams. He's just a 12 year old, 13 year old kid. And he says to his dad, Are, did you have a lot of those when you were young? And the dad just got beat red and it was like mm-hmm. awkward. And then the kid just was like, uh, no, I didn't, son. And then he realized, oh, well, it's not safe to talk about that. You know, that was the nonverbal he got back. Mm -hmm. And so rather than, hey, that's a great question. Yeah, that's a normal part of Mm -hmm. what happens to our bodies. Some Mm -hmm. young men, it happens more frequently than others. But, you know, I wouldn't worry about it. That's just a normal part of your body doing what your body does, you know, or giving small bits of information that are helpful. Yeah. Sometimes you talk about nerve endings. Yes. Strategic nerve endings, I like to say. Yeah. (laughs) What do you mean by that? Well, that there's certain parts of our body that are more sensitive to to pleasure, right? Our pleasure centers within the male and female body, the penis, the clitoris or clitoris, however you pronounce it, right? God did that. Those aren't like bad parts of the human body. They're just pleasure centers. They're soothing. And so starting with this aspect about understanding your body, learning your body, not demonizing those as evil, but just realizing that, you know, there's a, there's a lot of things that can bring good pleasure and sensation to us, right? A hot piece of apple pie with ice cream on it. That's really great. But if I have seven of them, it's probably not that great anymore, right? I'm flooding out or mismanaging. Hmm. So yeah. as those kids get older and you talk about understanding their bodies, that you start to have conversations about masturbation, I think this is the importance of affirming their sexuality and that not all your urges are lust and evil, but we have to learn how to manage them when they're connected to pornography, when you're objectifying someone, um, when you're choosing your sexuality outside of a committed monogamous relationship. And we would define that in our culture as marriage Um, and cultures define marriage in different ways, but, you know, we would say this is just the better way to manage that. And so, you know, but 
it's like anything else. Uh, food is something that our body requires. And if you don't eat enough, you'll starve. And if you eat too much, you're a glutton. You know, money is something that we use in our society. If you mismanage it, you could go into debt or you can become greedy. And neither of those are the better way. Uh, I, I, I hear a story of an Amish friend of mine who got his first iPhone. So in the Amish religion, this is like, you know, this is taboo, right? I mean, you don't do that. And he talked about how he felt guilt by just activating and using this. It was because in his religion, they looked down on this, or I, I'll use the word demonized, but not in a demon way, but just, you know, it was a little bit more of a shame. And he was only looking up like horse and buggies. He wasn't looking anything evil. But he talked about how he felt tremendous guilt just in just in using a technology. And I thought that was kind of interesting to me because we know that technology is not an ably evil, right? But if your religious culture never ever talks about it, for a young man or young woman who has an orgasm, whether it's through a wet dream, a nocturnal emission, or through discovering their body and touching themselves and it brings pleasure, if your culture never talks about that, then you can feel this shame just because yeah. you experience something that nobody ever experiences, you know, yeah. and kind of a false sense of guilt. And it's, um, it's one of those worlds through where it's, you know, we have to navigate it. And so I think just using the healthy versus unhealthy is a way better framework to ask yeah. your kids those questions. And if connected to pornography, how it can affect the brain, and, you know, you can have a kid that exper experiments uh, with their body, maybe masturbates four times or six times in their adolescent development. It's not that big a deal. They just understand their body. It was their experience. They didn't feel guilt. Where another kid, and we talk about this in the book, if you're not developing holistically, then you could run to sex as the only part of your life that you feel good about because you didn't make the baseball team, uh, you know, you didn't get that position in the band, you don't have good friends, acne's coming in your world. You got a lot of negative things happening in your world. Some kids move to those pleasure centers because it's the one part in their world that they feel good about, at least momentarily. And then masturbation becomes habitual. It becomes a way of, of coping. And I think that's really when it's, you, you cease from being unbeing. You're using something in a way that it wasn't designed to be, right? A coping mechanism to, 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 to manage uh, our traumas or negative experiences. And we really just believe in how you frame everything. That's why when we talk about in our book is more like family systems, because every conversation is not going to be around sex and masturbation, especially as they're, as they're teenagers, they desire to listen to their peers a little bit more than they listen to their parents. That's one reason why I believe just as much information as you can walk along with them even through that middle school pre-adolescent when they're like you're their hero and they think you do no wrong and they want to know everything you have to say because they do um, listen a lot to their peers and when they become in high school and young adult you want to be the safe person and so many times it comes back around and they want they want to hear from you again but there's yeah. that piece where it gets a little awkward for them sometimes but if you're talking about it in all areas you know, and you're, you're capitalizing on those times where you can talk about it, um, their sexuality. But in all areas of their life, how are they managing and mismanaging? Hmm. They're, they're catching that principle and that yeah. core, and they're starting to evaluate everything that they do because hmm. we're sexual beings, but in that is wrapped up all of these different things in our being and in our decision making. And so when you can, I think when you can give them that, good. then they have, um, they're looking at what, how to make the choices themselves. I love that. I want to ask you a question that I have that I'm dealing with right now, because my wife and I don't always agree on how to talk about sex with our daughter. How do you manage your own differences as parents? Well, how about, do you always agree on how to spend money? or what to do on vacation, yeah. or now we're talking about communication and conflict resolution, which really, uh, as Tracy was saying, it's about how we communicate and how we resolve conflict in all areas of our life. So I think a big part of the communication is being honest about what you think and how you feel about something. 
And then just learning to validate your partner. A, a validation doesn't mean you agree. It just means you understand their perspective. And this is really, really crucial. You know, if, if your wife would disagree or, or you disagree with her about what to say or not to say or when, um, just, just validating that. Hey, what I hear you saying is this is your concern and here's your reason why. And so just healthy communication sometimes um, helps the conflict improve because we just have good communication skills. You know there it mean? is again. Healthy is the new holy. So rather yes. than trying to meet this holy standard and hope my wife can get on board, we're pursuing yeah, right. it together. So, right. Just saying, okay, am I communicating healthy? Am I validating her? You know, I used to think when I first married Tracy, the goal was to get her to be just like me. <laughs> Boy, was good I luck. wrong. I I'm so sorry, Tracy, that, that you had luck. to go through that. No, I'd say good luck. <laughs> yeah, she's pretty, she's got an opinion, right? But then I realized, Drew, we already have one of me. We need one of her. I got yeah. me covered. Trust me, there's enough of me here to, to fill this. But her strengths hmm. are a compliment. My strengths are a compliment to her. Uh, we fill each other's gaps with our weaknesses. So sometimes on that communication piece, you know, even though this is a passion for you and you're you're leaning down this hard, be real open to what your wife says because that balance and that collective wisdom as parents, I think it can it can serve us well to say, you know what, let's consider that. Let me think about that for a while and try to get a win-win instead of I've got to be right all the time and win every argument. But just saying, hey, you've given me something to consider. Let me think about that. And then let's come back in a week and have this conversation again. And, and typically in disagreements, I get a little more escalated because I want to be right. I want her to see my way right away. But when we can um, give it some time, we call it a withhold, you know, where I want to say something. You don't have to respond. Just think about it for 30 minutes kind of a thing. It's a tool we use. Typically, we de-escalate in a half hour, and then we're more open to say, was there truth in what Tracy was saying? Typically, there always is. And then what would be a better way to respond so that we could move forward to finding a collective wisdom for the right decision? That's a really good question, though, Drew, because it's really common to have different parenting styles. Rodney and I definitely have different parenting styles. And... Again, that goes back to, do I think there's a right and a wrong way? I'm right, you're wrong. If we're always on that right, wrong, black and white, um, then we're then whether we do it right or we make a mistake or whatever, we're gonna blame the other person, but we should have done it my way. If we see it as that healthy, like you said, healthy is the new holy, we're looking at the healthiest way that we can do this. And we know that we, we modeled that, we modeled healthy as parents, even if we didn't, get it all right because we're not going to it might sound in this conversation like we can give you we can give you these um even these principles and then you're going to do it all right but you're not you're gonna you're gonna make mistakes and you're gonna go i don't know what to do on this situation and that's really okay it's an it's this ongoing it's just like everything else in life it's this ongoing journey that we're on and we're going to do some things well and others we're going to be like in hindsight i would do that yeah. completely different so in some ways we are demystifying sexuality as just another area of life. This is where it gets distorted for those of us who struggle with addiction because we've had so many messages because of pornography or because of mismanagement that there's a lot of shame just connected to sexuality. So even the conversation of masturbation, for many of us, it, it moved us to unbeing or sin. It wasn't helpful. It was more destructive. So even sometimes this conversation around this subject, it's really hard for us because, because we've been so damaged or are, are pre-programmed to how to see it as always bad or negative, right? So this is where as a parent, not just your sobriety, but even just moving maybe into some uncomfortable conversations that help you have a bigger picture of things, getting new perspectives of things, getting your paradigm challenged about something, um, because again, a lot of us can't think that way because we got a distorted message from the get-go. Uh, whether it was abuse or whether it was silence or whether it was overexposure at a young age and just kind of getting skewed in that. So the ultimate goal, at least for those of us that are married, is to have a, a pleasurable, healthy communication about our sexuality, being mature, and, and that's another language that we've talked about before, and, I, and you're giving great voice to this. If you see some of this behavior, it's just moving from immaturity to maturity. And in healthy marriage, 
We want to bring pleasure to our partner. That's what maturity looks like. Other centered, self-giving love. And so in healthy relationships, we kind of learn, learn how to do that. Yeah. We got some great new language today. If it's okay, I want to give a little spoiler for how to talk to your kids about sex because the final story you shared in this book inspired me and showed me such a beautiful, powerful alternative to purity culture. And it's when your daughter, Whitney, was turning 16 years old. Uh, Rodney gave her a ring. And you said, I gave her the ring. And I said, Whitney, this ring is not a promise ring. This is not a ring I'm giving you so that you promise me and your mother that you won't make any mistakes in the area of your sexuality. We want you to navigate this part of your life in a healthy way. But that's not what this ring is about. Sexuality was not the only area of life where we wanted her to make good decisions. I said, Whitney, otherwise you would have to promise me you'd never lie, gossip, steal, or cheat. You don't have enough fingers and I don't have enough rings for you to make every moral promise. I wasn't interested in having her make some external promise to me for my benefit. I wanted to motivate her to make good decisions out of seeing her internal worth and value. This is the part that made me cry. I said to her, Whitney, this ring is a value ring. This is not your promise to us. This is our promise to you. I want you to know that your value in our eyes will never change regardless of your behavior. Whether you make good decisions in life or you make poor decisions, your worth as our daughter will never change and we will always love you. Our heart will always be for you. If I as an earthly parent can love you this much, then how much more does God love us being our perfect heavenly father? I just wish every human being, male and female, could get that message. And they could love themselves from the internal, seeing a value ring. Yeah. I believe in the story of the prodigal, that's what the father gave the son who returned. Mm. That was the first value ring. <laughs> Maybe the kid threw the ring off and threw it at his dad when he left and said, I want nothing to do with you. And maybe the father kept that ring and said, this is always my son's ring. Yeah. And when he returned, he wasn't shaming him. He was just reinforcing the worth that was always there, you know. And I wanted, I did the same thing with my boys, not necessarily with a ring, but try to get that same message across. Your worth and value will never change. And it's not based on behavior. And you'll always be worthy of love, you know. And to me, that's the message that, that's the message that'll change the world. And that is why I always end every episode by saying, you are God's beloved son. In you, he is well pleased. Amen to that. So be it. Rodney. You got me crying, bud. <laughs> <laughs> Rodney I felt Tracy. so much shame. I felt so much shame as a young boy. You know, I felt like I never had the value. You know, I was the broken promise, you know. And uh, so if I could help another young Rodney out there someday, Drew, or a young girl, that mistakes are a part of their journey and they can learn instead of carrying shame. That's what I think that's the transformative part. So. And I was the rule follower that, you know, part of the purity movement that had the value necklace, you know, and, but I recognize even when Rodney came to me and our daughter's turning 16 and had that idea, it made so much sense. And it hadn't been a part of my story. I, but yet I thought it, what he was saying to me is like, so what do you do when you make a mistake? You give the ring back to your parents, you, you, you know, you shamed God, you shamed your family. What's the message that comes from that? And I said, yeah, that, uh, that absolutely makes perfect sense. Because for me, everything was about that leading up to marriage is me not making that mistake and just how much shame there is around when we make those choices. And so uh, I thought it was beautiful and much more the heart of God, yeah. even than that. And And we understand that parents and people are, um, they're doing that from good motives sometimes to help their mm -hmm. kids make good decisions. But mm -hmm. it's just, what is the aftermath of that yeah. is kind of what wasn't thought through. <laughs> right. So even our success in staying yes. away from sinful sexual behavior can be based on shame. And God wants yeah. so much more for his children. Yeah. Absolutely. Free us. I hope I hope all the guys listening uh, to your husband material podcast and all the things that you're doing is so cool. I hope they get the book and read it out loud with their spouse if they're married yeah. or if they're single, get it and read it and then do a book study on it with some buddies. How did your parents talk about it? What was helpful? What wasn't, you know? 
So tell people, how can they get a copy of How to Talk with Your Kids About Sex? You can come to our house in Coeur d'Alene and <laughs> we'll sell them out of our trunk and sign it and we'll feed you dinner. <laughs> but in case you can't do that, you can go to the Pure Desire website, puredesire.org, uh, puredesire.org, and you can look up in the store and just scroll down or put in the search bar, How to Talk with Your yeah. Kids About Sex. And uh, maybe you can find the link and put it on the screen as well and you can yes. get there. I will put a link to how to talk with your kids about sex in the show notes for this episode. And we mm -hmm. wanted to give one more opportunity for people because this topic is so big and we all have different questions. Yeah. Tracy and Rodney will be showing up inside our private Facebook group for a live Q and a later this week after this episode is published. So if you want to come bring your questions, we're going to talk about whatever didn't get covered in this episode. Okay. Thank you so much for joining us. Sounds good, thank you. Yeah, thanks Drew. And one more thing that I'll say, I don't know if it fits in or not, is just in, in the book, um, we included our email addresses. So if people wanna reach out, if they read the book and they have some um, feedback for us, positive or negative, we'd love to have that. In fact, Rodney even put his phone number in there. I didn't put mine, but Rodney loves to talk on the phone and he's very relational. So uh, that's another way of just contacting us too. Do you guys want me to put that in the show notes? I don't know. For sure. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Drew, we're just trying to get people to think and start having healthier dialogue. That's what you're doing. You're just creating healthier dialogue about this. And uh, you're giving guys a lot of good stuff out there, dude. Just like like your myths on masturbation and your yeah. what to do with an erection. You're just you're just lowering shame about the subject matter. And I just, I, I can't encourage you enough. Keep, I'm pushing you right, I'm, I'm behind you, dude. I am, or I'll lead the way as a blocker and you just carry the football and keep going, yeah. you know? Cause I, we gotta get over the goal line in this yeah. thing and help change culture. And you're doing it, dude, you really yeah, are. We're really glad you were part of the PSAP group and cause obviously there aren't a lot of people your age that are being able to help others right now a lot of times because that they're just on the front end of their journey and so it took a lot of courage I know for you to step out and say okay now I'm gonna, gonna use my own journey to help others and it's that's just so great we're really proud of you um, and you can put our emails in the show notes you don't have to play that or anything but okay. maybe just do emails and then Rod can decide who needs phone calls <laughs> great we all have our place on this journey and husband material is more for helping men heal awesome. after they have already been stuck in porn for years. And yeah. you are all taking a different place, maybe a little bit more upstream, preventing yeah. what yeah. many yeah. of us are in right now and allowing us to then use our stories, pursuing personal health, grieving totally. what has been done to us and creating a different future for the next generation. Yeah. yeah. And saying it with no shame to their kids because they've owned their story. They can say, hey, yeah. look, I went down this road yeah. and it's not helpful, you know, yeah. and uh, there's a better way. Let me show you the better way. You know? Amen. One last question. What is your favorite thing about freedom from porn? I think it's just, you know, learning how to integrate the way of God in my emotions and in my sexuality. So learning how to... Um, the healing journey brought me around to just being really grateful for my sexuality and just to embrace my humanity that when I go through negative things in life that are traumatic, uh, cause we still kind of go through traumatic things in life that make us feel all kinds of different emotions. I've just learned how to integrate the way of God in all those areas of my life and just be okay with having down days or I've had some depression through COVID, you know, just to just to give voice to it and say, yeah, I'm not doing real well today. How am I going to process this? Well, I could manage with over consuming fill in the blank, right? Any kind of behavior or I could process things better. So I think one of the things about being free from porn is realizing that, um, as they say, in internal family systems, you know, that was just a way of coping that was trying to help me, but it wasn't very helpful. It was it was more harmful than helpful. So just realizing there's healthy ways to process in life. And when you do it, ultimately it, um, it comes back around as something reinforces your worth and value, you know? So I, you know, there, there's a piece of it there. How about you, Tracy? What's your favorite thing about freedom from porn? Well, she wasn't addicted. Number one. <laughs> yeah. I'm grateful that, yeah, that I wasn't introduced in a way that I had to 
yeah, that I had to unlearn and relearn in that area. Um, but I think that I'm grateful for the education and understanding of sexual addiction um, because it doesn't, even as a betrayed spouse, um, a husband in recovery, I don't have fear. It doesn't have a power over me. I don't live in a fear of pornography. I, I can see it for what it is rather than it being a threat. And I think as a wife, that's, that's a big deal. It's not a threat and it doesn't define um, my worth. It doesn't say anything about my worth of my spouse and myself. That's when you know that you have a, that piece of you has been really healed and that's yeah. beautiful. Amen. Thanks again. And for everyone else out there, always remember you are God's beloved son and you, he's well pleased.